Action films. Not since the Western has a genre been so deeply entangled with the male identity. Men sit in the theater, growing tense in their seats, eyes widened in religious fervor, as the hardened bodies of Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Statham, Gibson, Willis gesticulate in indicators of masculine pride. Shooting, chasing, punching, diving, kicking, wrestling, hugging. Knuckles go white as male viewers clench their fists. Will our hero make it over this final hurdle? And then, a sigh of relief, as a bead of sweat cascades down the chest of our chiseled leading man. He's won the day again. And as a final line is delivered through pearly white teeth, Hasta la vista, baby. Our male viewer blinks back a tear, refusing to show weakness in the face of such tenacity. Everything is okay in the end. It always is. Action films offer a safe space for men. A low culture comfort not unlike rom-coms for women, with each one fulfilling a set of familiar cliches. The emotionally detached hero with his unwavering moral code, beaten down until his moment of reckoning, when he realizes he has to fight his way out of unbeatable odds, with nothing but his grit to save him. The unexpected partnership, the grizzled mentor who bites it in the second act, the antagonist who threatens the stability of the social order, but is often actually kind of justified, who our hero must defeat to realign the status quo. Each one of these comfortable tropes, the adrenaline of violence, the thrill of the chase, brings viewers a step closer to that unconscious gratification. These are the familiar cliches that Point Break promised to fulfill in 1991. And to the untrained eye, it did. This is what it sold. A series of bank robberies have been terrorizing the city of LA. The robbers, a group of masked men dressed in the likeness of former US presidents, I'm not a crook. are largely non-violent and highly skilled. Rookie FBI agent and former college athlete Johnny Utah, played by Keanu Reeves, is assigned to their case. I guess we just must have ourselves an asshole shortage, huh? Not so far. Whose superior, played by Gary Busey, has a hunch originating from a butt tan line caught on tape that our smooth criminals are really a gang of surfers. 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 Together, he and Johnny set out to break through this irreverent subculture, with Johnny acting as the mole. During his time with the surfers, however, Johnny becomes deeply enveloped into their worldview. With the alluring brazenness of his girlfriend Tyler, played by Lori Petty, and her prophetic, enigmatic friend Bodie, played by Patrick Swayze, Johnny struggles to navigate the balance between his two opposing lives. His conflicting worlds come to a head when he discovers that his suspects are not, in fact, the brutish Nazi surf gang he's been chasing this whole time, but Bodie and his gang of spiritual adrenaline junkies. What follows is a thrilling cat and mouse game of street chases, car warfare, and skydiving fights. Every box is ticked. Shootouts, explosions, bloodshed, dynamic camera work and falls from great heights, a green protagonist and a damsel love interest, an antagonist outsmarting his foes at every turn and threatening to destabilize the sexuality of our hero with his wild golden hair, seductive blue eyes, and muscular body which undulates as he makes love to the great expanse that is the Pacific Ocean. Wait a second. Before we start the video, a quick word from our sponsor. I've recently been facing this dilemma where I'll watch a movie or TV show, completely fall in love with it, finish it, and then lull into a two or three week period where I desperately try to fill the void with equally good content. I've tried the classic movie similar to blank Google search, but it never quite gets me to that niche result I'm looking for. It got to the point where I watched Fleabag three times in a single month because I couldn't really find anything to match it. This is why Likewise is such a useful tool. Powered by a combination of smart technology and a community of people who are truly engaged, Likewise is an app that'll give you personalized recommendations which align with your interests. It's a great place to discover all the best movies, TV shows, books, podcasts, and more. You can easily organize and share all your favorite movies and shows using Likewise's list feature, or you can save them from the Today Card, which is a daily list of recommendations curated by the app itself. But I think my favorite aspect of the app is the ask feature. When I was writing this video, I got curious about whether or not there are other action movies out there that are just as 
special as Point Break. So I wrote a community post and I got a ton of suggestions and comments. One person even went above and beyond and wrote little blurbs about why each individual movie was the perfect fit for the specific description I was looking for. They recommended everything from The Boys to Into the Spider-Verse to Hot Fuzz, which is the action movie I think I'm going to watch next. I then compiled all the recommendations into a list, which anyone on the app can look at or comment on. So definitely check out Likewise. It's 100% free, and if you want, you can even follow me at Baroe de Chanel. Again, if you want to get some great recommendations and help to support my channel in the process, go to on.likewise.com slash by clicking the link at the top of the description and download the app today. Now, on with the video. Point Break is anything but typical. From inception to promotion, this film threatened to be subversive at every turn. The screenplay, written by W. Peter Illiff, had originally fallen into the hands of Ridley Scott back in 1986. It would be called Riders of the Storm, named after the iconic countercultural hit by The Doors, and would potentially star Matthew Broderick. But that thankfully fell through, and the script would lie in production purgatory for a few years until it was picked up again, this time by Catherine Bigelow. Now, Catherine Bigelow herself occupies a liminal space in the film industry. Catherine Bigelow! She's the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Director, yet consistently dodges the title of woman filmmaker. Maybe 10 years ago, no one ever would have let a woman direct this kind of picture. Do you, do you agree? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, that's a sad concept, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's re real, isn't Probably it? Probably real, yeah. Yeah. So how did you come into it? Well, I liked the script. I wanted to do it, and um, I couldn't. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't dignify gender as a sort of something that would um, that would be uh, that would hold somebody back. You know, so I mean, I didn't. I didn't even acknowledge that as something that would be a problem. She's a filmmaker who is a woman, yet operates in genres that are coded by masculinity. Her most critically successful film, for example, is The Hurt Locker, a movie about the inner politics of an American bomb disposal team in Baghdad during the height of the Iraq War. Critics, scholars, and audiences have been confounded over the years about where to place Catherine Bigelow because she is a moving target. While the mission of putting a feminist or even feminine lens over Bigelow's films can quickly lead onto the path of gender essentialism, I'm confident that Point Break is the strongest example of a film within her body of work that uses a quietly subversive feminine filmmaking within a distinctly masculine genre. This idea came to me while I was watching Be Kind Rewind's video, Chloe Zhao's Oscar win, Moment or Movement, particularly when she said this. Bigelow's interests happen to align with the visual and thematic languages we already understand to be worthy of prestige. That got me thinking. Does Bigelow use the language of masculinity both to be valued in a patriarchal industry and to convey highly complex, even feminine, themes? Point Break, according to some, is visually stunning if intellectually shallow, and a dose of macho claptrap typical identifiers of the much beloved but critically dismissed action genre. But I argue that there's something very intentional hiding in plain sight that makes Point Break not only a classic which blends together high and low culture, but a work of art in itself. Bigelow is an artfully minded filmmaker. She got her masters at Columbia and studied under legendary scholars like Susan Sontag and Andrew Saris, obtaining a degree in theory and criticism. Later in the 70s, she would go on to work with the collective Art and Language, where she created conceptual art, occasionally experimenting with the medium of film. Let's look at the capitalist mode of thought. There, she would make her first notable short film and gain the attention of renowned director Milos Forman. My work with art and language was profound in, in, for me. I mean, I, I really value it highly. And um, it really gave me a foundation and um, I guess an ability to have as much critical distance with the work as possible. So we're looking at someone who has a very firm grasp of the intersection between visuality and theory. In a 1995 interview for Art Forum, she reflected on her background, saying, I was matriculating in film history and criticism. I was reading Freud, which led me to the philosophy department. I was working on semiotext. I had Peter Wallen as a teacher and Edward Said, extraordinary thinkers. 
So naturally, I was influenced by them, which ironically pulled me back into the art world. Structuralist thought is hopelessly out of fashion now, but it's what led me to The Loveless, my first feature-length narrative film. Bigelow views film as a meditation. Her background in art informs her perspective on filmmaking. She approaches it much like a sculpture, which can be easily molded to evoke a different set of meanings with each subtle manipulation of the clay. For this reason, Bigelow's interested in genre bending. Playing with genre is both conscious and unconscious, because I don't think you're ever immune to genre. Even if you choose not to use it, that's a loaded decision in and of itself. But I have a desire to subvert and redefine. Genre exists for that purpose. It's a great interlocutor with the audience, a way in, a language they can understand and that makes them comfortable. Once you touch base in a genre, you can go in any direction. It's how we got Near Dark, a neo-western about nomadic, bloodthirsty vampires. Or Strange Days, a crime film about race in America which fuses together the conventions of noir and sci-fi. But Point Break isn't really a fusion of two genres. It's clearly an action film. What Bigelow is doing with it, however, is stretching the conventions of the action film very close, but not quite, to the point of parody. Everything here operates in extremes. The explosive testosterone of the police department. Over the last two weeks, you two have produced exactly squat! Squat! Which brims with such absurd male rage that you can't help but laugh. The drawn-out action sequences, which carry on and replicate themselves for such extended periods of time that you feel like you've snapped out of a trance by the time the credits roll. The one-liners characteristic of action films, so on the nose they're just ridiculous. Young, dumb, and full of cum. And the choice to cast Keanu Reeves, who's notorious for his self-aware delivery of lines. Maybe you ought to just take some early retirement right now and get some rent-a-cop night security job. As Martha M. Lawson notes, while appearing to adhere to the rules of the action genre, Bigelow also exaggerated them in such an unrelenting fashion that she seemed to be toying with how far she could take both her characters and the audience. But that's not all she does to thwart her viewers. She also makes explicit what we'd known about the action genre all along. It's pretty homoerotic. And this is where her expertise as both a filmmaker and artist become readily apparent. Far from intellectually shallow, Bigelow exploits the conventions of the action genre to give us an in-depth examination of yearning between men. Right off the bat, Keanu Reeves proves an interesting choice for an action hero, especially when compared to the inflated, hardened bodies of Schwarzenegger and Stallone, who had dominated action films of the decade prior. Reeves is sinewy and clean-shaven. He plays the character with an almost, in the words of Bigelow, childlike enthusiasm. Likewise, Laurie Petty is not your typical damsel in distress. With her hair cropped short and her demeanor brash and unpolished, she occupies more of the typical identifiers of masculinity than Reeves himself. I mean, her name is Tyler. My name's Johnny Utah! Who cares? As April Wolf observes in Rolling Stone, Johnny and Tyler are polar opposite puzzle pieces that fit together perfectly. His feminine edges nudge nicely to her masculine ones. In nearly every scene they share, they are portrayed by the camera as equals. When we first meet Tyler, we get the sense that Johnny's attracted to her, but his attraction is ambiguous. The blank expression Johnny watches her with as she awkwardly changes out of her wetsuit under a towel is the same one he reserves for Bodhi. There has seldom been a film stuffed so full of homoerotic symbolism. A phallic shadow of a gun looming over Johnny's head while he sleeps, bullets bursting out of a gun into the air in his frustrated rage. Even the imagery of the surfboard evokes something within the mind. In an essay on the homoeroticism of Point Break, Sam Reimer uses suture theory to underpin the very deliberate ways that Bigelow conveys yearning between Johnny and Bodhi. Suture theory is based on psychoanalysis and was brought into the realm of film by scholars like Daniel Dayan and Kaya Silverman. It's concerned with how viewers are essentially stitched or sutured to the fabric of a film. In other words, it's all about the illusion of cinema. There are many mechanisms of the film process that allow us to forget we're watching through a camera, but the one that Reimer identifies in Point Break is the shot reverse shot, where one subject looks at another subject who is off screen, and then we cut to the other subject looking back at them. It's an incredibly common device in filmmaking, so common that it's often invisible to the eye. According to Reimer, the shot reverse shots drive us to ask who is watching this and who is ordering these images which stress the importance of monitoring perspective and subjectivity and how they rub against and overlap with each other. Much of the yearning in Point Break exists within this technique. Most of what we're seeing of Bodhi is through Johnny's gaze in sequences of shot-reverse shots. 
As we enter a party scene, we watch from Johnny's perspective, passing through the action, the camera unsteady, searching. Finally, we come upon a woman who's bent over backwards. The camera looks up, and there's Bodhi. Shot. Reverse of Johnny looking disappointed. Shot. Reimer notes that the use of first person and the stalker-like aesthetic it assumes while searching for Bodhi frames this reveal like a discovery of infidelity, a betrayal of presumed inclinations. Johnny's ambiguous sexuality is revealed again in the famous chase scene. Jumping from a seamless steadicam shot of the men running through the streets, to some very adept handheld work as they dart in and out of people's homes, the tension of the scene builds to a head when Johnny jumps off a wall and injures his knee. As he lies helpless on the ground, he aims his gun at Bodhi, who is climbing over a fence to escape. The music slows, and what follows is a series of shot reverse shots. Bodhi in his Nixon mask turning around, Johnny lying on the ground pointing his gun, each shot growing closer and closer to the men in succession. A moment of recognition. It ends when Bodhi's blue eyes meet the barrel of the gun. This intimate sequence lingers for a moment until Johnny breaks the tension and directs his fury at the sky, letting Bodhi go. Or take the scene where Johnny first lays eyes on Bodhi in the water. Our rock anthem cuts and a soft melody starts to play. Bigelow balances a triptych of shot reverse shots between Johnny, who faces the water, Tyler, who faces Johnny, and Bodhi in the ocean gliding over the waves. Typically in a shot reverse shot, the camera has to abide by the spatial relations of a scene, staying on the correct side of an imaginary axis of the frame so we understand where each player is located within the space. What complicates this scene is that Bodhi begins on the right side of the axis, with a reverse shot of Johnny looking enraptured, but then he crosses over to the left side of the frame in the following shots, breaking the illusion of spatial continuity. Once the axis is crossed, the shots close in and become more dynamic. Is Johnny floating in the water? Is he enhancing this moment in his own mind? Reimer notes that this crossing of the axis produces a spatially impossible, almost dreamlike quality to our perspective on Bodhi. And when compared with the conventional framing between Johnny and Tyler, Reimer argues that the crossing of the axis suggests a romantic bias towards Bodhi. These three examples of shot reverse shot are very technical and almost invisible, but they're deliberate. In Johnny's eyes, surfing, the ocean, and Bodhi offer an entrance into the sensuous unknown. These moments are subtle, but with Bigelow's artful eye at the helm, we get a sense of what she's trying to do here. She sutures the viewer to this subtext of yearning between Johnny and Bodhi without having to say a thing at all, and she does so in a genre characterized by its reverence of the heterosexual and the hypermasculine. Ultimately, the satirical genius of Point Break lies in Bigelow's fundamental understanding that the strength of action films is in their ability to convey meaning through visual spectacle. Johnny is on the path to self-identification. He and Bodhi bond over what Yvonne Tasker calls a flirtation with death. Bigelow combines her interest in the sensuality of violence and death with an explicit sensual connection between our protagonist and antagonist. I know it's hard for you, Johnny. I know you want me so bad it's like acid in your mouth, but not this time. As Tasker states, in the constitution of identity through complex, shifting identifications, the popular cinema forms one space in which identities can be affirmed, dissolved, and redefined within a fantasy space. Bigelow is stretching the conventions of action films to their limits, breaking them down and sculpting new meaning out of them. In rejection of the limiting and patronizing label of woman filmmaker, we should understand Bigelow instead as an artist. Her films may present as intellectually shallow, but her subtle and rebellious command over visual language, and her appreciation for the soft interior of masculinity, separate her from her peers. As James Cameron once said, I can't wait till Point Break comes out, because they'll say, Catherine Bigelow, that must be some strange Eastern European pseudonym for a man. Catherine? It doesn't sound like a man's name, but it must be. Women don't do action like this. It will be very interesting to see the response as the world catches up to you. Thank you again to Likewise for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click the link in the description on.likewise.com slash broey to download the app today. Special thank you to Luiosta, Syed Hassan, Malpertui, Cooper Stimson, Nina E, James Barcelona, Tenzing Mingmar, Jessica, Nadia C, Sean Bay, and Greg Peter for supporting this channel.